Greetings, everyone. Once again, we gather. I know this is my greeting each week. We gather around God's Word, and we want to see what God's Word has to say to us. We're continuing in our study in Joseph, about Joseph's life in Genesis. And uh, there's so much relevant information here for us. There's so much that we should apply to our lives in things that Joseph's circumstances, Joseph's situation, Joseph's response, how these things should teach us how we should respond to the Lord, to the circumstances we face in life, and how we should deal with disappointments and discouragements. So, uh, I'm going to pray as I start, and then we'll, uh, we'll dig into God's Word, right? Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your presence in our lives. I trust that most that are watching are truly trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If there's anyone who is watching this, Father, that is not trusted in Christ, they've not, they've not submitted to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord, He's Master, He's the Savior, He's the only way to heaven, I pray that you'd help them to understand that reality and to trust the Lord Jesus Christ in a very personal way. May your Holy Spirit lead in that, Father, I pray. But for the rest of us, Father, I pray that we would be able to see your word clearly today. We'd be able to recognize the applications that apply to our lives. And that we would be willing to obey and follow these things so that we can live lives that honor you. I pray, Father, that you'll help the things that I say today to be perfectly in line with your word. And may the truth of your word jump off the page to us today, Father, so that we will see these things in a way that excites us, gives us enthusiasm, it gives us encouragement, Father, I pray for that. Strengthen our faith, strengthen our walk with you, Father, I pray that you'd help in that. Again, I love you, I praise you for what you're doing in, in, in the life of our church, I pray that you'd help us as we deal with some of the challenges that we've experienced and that we would be able to move forward in faith, trusting you. Help us in that, Father. Use this today for your glory. Teach us well, please, Father, by your Holy Spirit. And I pray in Jesus' name. And again, all God's people said, Amen. All right. You know, back years ago when Donna and I moved to Dallas, we um, were there just a few days. In fact, it was Donna's birthday. Uh, we'd been there just a few days, and we had saved up money to go out for supper that night. Uh, we were uh, strapped financially at the time. We'd spent most of all we had in preparations to go to seminary, and both of us were working at that time, but um, we were a bit strapped. And one, the, the morning of Donna's birthday, I went out to run some errands, and we had an apartment in, in uh, well, just, just east of the seminary. And this wasn't the best district of Dallas at the time. And um, the cars were parked behind the apartment complex. And uh, there, was, there, were, there were some uh, uh, places where cars were protected from the elements there. They weren't garages, but there, were, there was covering. And I uh, went out to, and, and I noticed my hood was up and went to get in the car. And in fact, I closed the hood, went into the car and went to start. It, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't turn over. Oh, something's wrong. So I went back to look to see why the hood was up. And lo and behold, somebody had stolen our battery. Well, you know, sometimes in life we experience some emotional highs. We were looking for a fun time that day as it was Donna's birthday and we were going to do something special. That was going to be an emotional high, but it turned into an emotional low. And, you know, it's interesting, that, that's, that battery story reminds me, I heard about, I don't know if this was a seminary couple or what, because another pastor told me about this, how a couple living down there in Texas, they went out to their car one morning and they noticed that the battery was missing, but there was a note that said, I'm sorry, I had to get to the hospital, it was an emergency, I will return your battery later. And, you know, this couple thought, oh, is that really true or not? Well, later in the day, they went out, there was a note, there was the battery, and said, thank you so very much for letting me do this. 
because of your kindness and letting me do this, granted, they weren't, ne they weren't necessarily uh, asked if they could, but because of your kindness, here are tickets to the Dallas Cowboys game this coming Sunday. And this couple, wow, we get to go to the Cowboys game. And they were excited about that. So the emotional lows of battery missing, emotional high of having the battery back and the tickets to go to the Cowboy game. So they went to the Cowboy game that next Sunday. They got home from the Cowboy game. And lo and behold, their apartment had been cleaned out. The person that had stolen their battery had not done that because they needed to get to the hospital, but rather the person had set them up so that he knew when they were going to be gone and their apartment was literally cleaned out. They were robbed. Talk about emotional highs and emotional lows. That's something about life that we need to learn to deal with. And today we're looking at Joseph's life and we're going to see how Joseph, he experienced emotional highs he also experienced some emotional lows. We're not told so much about his lows in the sense that his emotions didn't seem to go up and down based on what the scriptures express. We do see in Psalm 105, and I'll use that, I'll read some of that later in the message. In Psalm 105, it says that Joseph was treated very, very roughly at times when he was in Egypt. When he was by his brothers, he was treated roughly. He was treated roughly some in Egypt. It says that the, the, uh, the chains of his imprisonment, they bruised his legs. And it, it says that, that we'll read that later. So he had emotional highs. Yes, I'm sure. So I'm sure he had to learn how to deal with the disappointments and the discouragements that came with all the circumstances that he faced. And in this lesson today, we're entitling this, Joseph hope, Joseph's hope-filled faith that never wavered. I think he might have had some challenges at times, but it never wavered. The scriptures teach that he was faithful, and therefore he was able to resist resentment, and he remained resilient, and he was able to accomplish the things for which God had called him to do. Now, as we look and see the, uh, the context of where we are on this, we studied a few weeks ago, chapter 37, Joseph's dreams and clothing became a theme for us to follow. He had dreams, and therefore, in the lesson we're looking at today, he interpreted dreams. But as 37, his dreams and clothing became a theme to follow. That coat of, of, of many colors. Chapter 39, we studied this last week, Joseph's clothing which was, he, he, he ran off without his clothes when uh, Potiphar's wife grabbed his garment that was used to accuse him and put him in jail. So the clothing was a the theme there. We get to chapter 40, and with God's help, he accurately interpreted two dreams. And therefore, clothing and dreams had a theme that, that, that we carry through the story of Joseph here in, in Genesis 37 through 50. Now, in our lesson today, we see with special blessing of the Lord's presence, Joseph was able to correctly interpret the disturbing dreams of Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. Within three days, the cupbearer would be freed from prison. He'd been cast into the prison. We're going to see that in the passage we read. And then he was restored to his position. But the issue is, is the baker who was also cast into prison at the same time as the cupbearer, the baker, he had a dream, and the dream was interpreted that he was going to be executed. Just think, Joseph had to interpret these dreams, and the, the pressure on him to be able to tell someone, well, hey, you're going to be released from prison, the excitement, emotions high, and then the next guy, well, you know what, in three days, you're going to be executed. Now, that's a challenging thing. Now, the lessons that we learn from Joseph's situation, they are designed to help us recognize that the Lord is testing his faithful followers. He tests us. He allows us to be challenged. He allows us to face trials. He allows us to face times where we wonder what's going to happen next. But these are a way to prepare us for the ministries he has for our lives and they're also designed to strengthen our faith for facing times of discouragement. Why? Because we live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful society. And we need to learn to face these things. Now, there's three overarching truths that I want to use to introduce this study today. 
Number one, we saw this last week, and we say it again today, God is always working to cause all things, everything that happens, to fit together for what's best for those who lovingly submit to his authority and are called according to his perfect plans. Now, as we look at that, let's realize God never is the author of sin. He uses sin. He knows it's going to happen, and God uses sin to bring about his purposes, but he never authors it. He never forces it. He never causes it. But now the second truth is because we live in a sinful society, I mentioned that before, our obedience to God can sometimes lead us to, lead to unpleasant circumstances. Sometimes we're going to face things that, whoa, I didn't, ex I didn't sign up for this, but because we trust Christ, because we follow Jesus, we're going to say no to things that may cause people to question, may cause people to challenge, may cause us to face various temptations or troubles that, that we don't want to face, but we need to face those things. But then finally, the third the third truth that introduces this lesson today is unpleasant circumstances. They aren't necessarily an indication that God isn't present. They are also not an, an indication that God is not pleased with us. It's always possible that God is working in the background to test, train, or teach us something for our benefit. Those are truths we look at to introduce this lesson today. But as we read the passage, Genesis chapter 40, grab your Bible, if you would, follow along as I read. Uh, you can pause the video and, and, and take a moment to grab your Bible if you don't have it. I trust maybe you're used to getting your Bible when we look at these videos. But nonetheless, chapter 40, verse 1. Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now let me go back a few verses we realize that Joseph was unjustly placed into this prison because Potiphar's wife had lied that he had tried to force himself upon her. That didn't happen. She was trying to force him into a situation where he said no. And when his master, Potiphar, heard the words of his wife that she said that lied about Joseph, she said, this is what your slave did to me. His anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. Joseph was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness, loyal love, unfailing love, mercy, extended that to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief bailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners. And they were the ones that were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, Joseph was responsible for it. Now the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord, was, the Lord made it to prosper. And therefore Joseph was trustworthy. Now we read on, back to chapter 40. We starting with verse two now. It came up, you know, the the, the baker, and the chief, the the, the, the cupbearer. They're in prison because they angered Pharaoh. It says Pharaoh was furious with these two officials, the cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard. That's Potiphar's house. In the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. So Joseph was imprisoned where he had been a servant, where he'd been a slave. Now, he'd reached the, the, the plateau of being in charge of the whole household, but then this, Potiphar's wife lied, and Joseph landed in prison. Now, it says, verse 4, The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of the, the chief uh, baker and the chief uh, cupbearer. He put him in charge of them, and it says they were in confinement for some time. Now, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt who were confined in the jail, both had a dream on the same night. Each man his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. That's the scripture explaining what's going on there. Dreams and interpretation of dreams were very, very, uh, well, they were a very prominent part of the Egyptian lifestyle. Now, 
I don't know if all those dreams were in fact from God. This dream was from God. I think some of the dreams that were there in Egypt were probably from the false gods and everything else, and they were probably demonic in nature. But these, these were from God. And it was part of the culture, so therefore no one was surprised, no one was upset about it. They saw these dreams were part of what went on. It says, uh, when Joseph came to them in the morning, he observed, he looked at them, he recognized, he's in charge of them, and he says they were dejected. He noted that they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Well, they said to him, we've had a dream and there was no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not, in, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and Joseph said to him in my, and, and said to him, told the dream to Joseph and said to him, said to Joseph, in my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches, and it was budding, and its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Uh, on the vine were the three branches, it was budding, and the blossoms came out, and produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Well, then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches stand for three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you used to be his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you. There's Joseph making a request. Keep me in mind when it goes well with you. Please do a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. Even here I have done nothing that should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there were some, all, there, there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh off of you. Thus came, it came about that on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his offic official position and put the cup into Pharaoh and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had, had interpreted to him. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but actually forgot him. That's the passage. That's what we see here. I want to explain in three parts what was going on here as we try to explain how God is, is using this in a very specific way. You know, we're going to look at the narrative first, and then we'll look at the applications later. Now, we need to understand that because Joseph recognized God's presence. He knew God was with him. He relied on, on God. He relied on him to enable him to fulfill God's purpose. Joseph understood that he had a purpose. That's what kept him going. That's what kept him encouraged. That's what kept him basically fighting off the disappointments and the discouragements which he obviously probably faced because of the various ups and downs that he experienced. Now he was unjustly put in prison, but the Lord was with him. He knew the Lord was with him. Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker had offended Pharaoh and he put them in jail, so there, Joseph had more people under his charge. Now, Joseph was specifically put in charge of them to, as the chief, uh, the chief, <laughs> uh, the chief of the jail. I, I, I'm, I'm looking to the text here and, and, and seeing what it says here. The chief jailer. Um, 
he specifically appointed these two officials to be under Joseph's charge. Joseph was to watch over them and carefully take care of them. And both the cupbearer and the baker had this dream on the same night. Joseph observed. That's Joseph's responsibility. He was observant. He saw that they were dejected. He sought out to find out what's going on, what happened, how can I help? And he asked, why are your faces so sad today? They told him, we had a dream, but there's no one to interpret. They're in jail, outside, maybe dreams were common, and people interpret them. Who knows if they ever came true or not? But Joseph made the statement, a very important statement. We're going to look at this very carefully as we look at the applications. He says, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So Joseph was reaching out to help. Now, the second piece of this narrative, the Lord enabled Joseph to interpret the dreams. And Joseph used this as an opportunity to try to plead his case before Pharaoh. Joseph was looking for ways. He, he realized he was in jail. He felt that God had a plan for his life. And he probably felt a little bit, um, well out of sorts in light of the fact that, that, that he didn't see where God was using him in that particular place. But now this dream came up and God enabled him to interpret the dreams. The cupbearer gave Joseph the details of his dream. We heard it as I read it. It included a vine with three branches, grapes to squeeze into Pharaoh's cup, and that was then the cup was put into Pharaoh's hand. Now the meaning, three branches... It meant three days. In three days, he would be released to his old job. That's what Joseph told him. So Joseph's confident request of the cupbearer came with an explanation. He says, well, you're going to get out. So when this goes well with you, will you please tell Pharaoh about me? And he says, he explained, I don't belong here. I'm a Hebrew. And I was, was sold into slavery. I was kidnapped. I was basically, uh, I was brought here against my will. And he's, I've done nothing wrong to put me in this prison. And that was a true statement. And that was Joseph's one time of explaining what was going on. Now, some say that Joseph was possibly putting his faith in a person. I don't believe that's the case. I think Joseph just saw the opportunity and he recognized, maybe God provided this for me. But nonetheless, he asked that of the cupbearer. Now, the baker saw that Joseph's first interpretation was favorable, so he told Joseph the details of his dream. He, he said that, and, 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 and Joseph had said, all right, well, tell me. He said that before. So, the dream included three baskets filled with bread for Pharaoh, and the baskets were on the, uh, the chief baker's head. And the birds were eating bread out of the baskets. On the top basket were many pastries for Pharaoh. Now the meaning, the three baskets, again, it meant three days. But the problem was in three days, this man's head was going to be lifted from his body. And then he would be hanged on a tree where the birds would feast on his flesh. Now, the first interpretation was something positive, good news. The second interpretation was something very, very difficult, bad news. And Joseph told the truth in both areas, both times. Now, we see in the end of the passage that Joseph's prophecies were perfectly fulfilled. His prophecies, they were fulfilled exactly as he said. But his promise that he asked of the cupbearer, it was forgotten. It was forgotten. On the third day, Pharaoh's birthday, celebration. He made a feast for his servants. And that's where he restored the cupbearer to his office. But then on that same day, he executed the baker just as Joseph had interpreted. So the cupbearer, he's got a responsibility because he was supposed to tell Pharaoh based on what Joseph had, they, they'd agreed. But yet, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. That's what verse 23 says. Now what I want to say in the, is, is I conclude and move toward the applications, 
Let's understand the Lord's teaching here, Joseph. He's teaching him, and he's teaching him to trust in him alone. Joseph asked the cupbearer, but the cupbearer, he wasn't able to fulfill it. Why? We don't know. It was a temporary forgetting because God's timing is always perfect. And eventually the cupbearer remembered. And we'll see that in chapter 41. But what we have in this passage, we have several applications and lessons that are in time and designed to strengthen our faith. And I want us to see these things because they relate to our lives in a very specific manner. Number one, when Joseph acknowledged that interpretations belong to God, he was recognizing that he needed the Lord's help to interpret dreams. Joseph isn't standing out there saying, look at me, look at what I can do. Joseph wasn't an individual that put himself out there saying, okay, I'm God's gift to humanity. Rather, on the other side, Joseph said, these dreams, these interpretations, they belong to God. And in Genesis 41, verses 14 through 16, we'll turn the page and look at this. This is next week's lesson. Pastor Andy will be preaching next week. But in 14 through 16, it says, when Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, why did he call for Joseph? Because the cupbearer remembered and said, hey, there's a guy in jail that can, can interpret dreams correctly. They hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, but no one can interpret it, and I have heard it, heard it about you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. But listen to Joseph's answer. But Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So then Pharaoh said, Well, tell me about it. And as we see that, Joseph was giving God the glory. He said, I'm not able to interpret. I'm not, I'm not able to interpret. I don't have the ability to interpret without God's help. And he said, God will be able to help me. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus reminds his disciples, he reminds us, without me, you can do nothing. In all we do, we should do it for God's glory. And we should recognize that God deserves all the glory, all the credit, all the praise. When we take all the pride for ourselves, we're actually going to miss out on God's grace because God says, I'm opposed to the proud, but I give grace to the humble. And therefore, we should, like Joseph, acknowledge that God is the one that enables us to do the things that we do. We should realize we have spiritual gifts that God gives us, and he gets the glory for that. We should realize God, he, he created us with various talents, various abilities. And God receives the credit. In all we do, we should do it for God's glory. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves. We get so focused on things that go on around us. And we, we just, just dig in and do things. And we take credit that we don't deserve. And I'm sorry when I've done that, and I think all of us should realize God gets the glory. But then secondly, Joseph's experiences teach us to look beyond the moment so we can see how God is working in the details. We should always look and see how God's working in the details. We should always ask God, what are you teaching me today? What are you showing me today? What are the things that are happening around me, Father, that you are bringing together, you're fitting things together for the fact that you have a plan and you have a purpose. Our secular society has essentially eliminated God from their belief system. God is not included. As, as I watched various political things this week with the, the, the convention on, on, on uh, you know, I, I didn't watch much of it, just a tiny bit, but I don't hear much about God in anything that these people are saying. And, and I'm fearful that, that the society around us is eliminating God from the entire focus. And the most accurate description of our culture's philosophy, I believe it often leads to futility. Like Solomon said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Why? Because Solomon lost sight of God's purpose in his life. Now Solomon, he, he reneged on all that. He changed that perspective as he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. 
But nonetheless, the philosophy of our culture, it leads to futility. Let's realize God has saved us to be his witness to the world. And we are here to display a sincere sense of hope. Now, that doesn't mean that we're never going to be disappointed. We're never going to be discouraged. But we should always look to God for the strength. We should look to God for the encouragement. We should look to God to see he's at work in the details of our lives. And we should ask him consistently, what should I learn from this? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me as I read your word? Joseph's experiences teach us to look beyond the moment so we can see that God is at work in the details of our lives. Thirdly, Joseph must have faced the constant temptation to become disappointed and discouraged. He had ups and downs. There's no biblical evidence that he was discouraged ever. We're never, we never see that. Joseph was steadfast. His faith, according to Genesis 37 through 50, was firmly fixed on God. And Joseph fulfilled his responsibilities in such a way that it brought honor to God. People were, they, they saw that it was remarkable what he did, and Joseph pointed to God. But now, as we consider all of this, let's understand that God allowed Joseph to ride on an emotional roller coaster. The biblical text indicates that he, was on a, that he had an absolute and unshakable assurance that God was with him in the midst of everything he faced. That's what the text shows us. Over and over again, God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. Moses wrote that years later, and Joseph obviously or apparently understood that God was with him. He had a deep confidence in God's faithfulness. He had endurance because he saw that God was at work in the details of his life. He faced the constant temptation, probably, of discouragement and disappointment. But he looked above the circumstances, and he said, God's at work. Now, the fourth thing I want us to see is that there, are to, in, in my estimation, as I look at this passage, there are three concluding truths about dealing with difficulties, discouragement, and disappointments. God doesn't want us to ever develop a spirit of bitterness. He doesn't ever want us to have a sense of resentment. God wants us to look above circumstances. We face challenges, we face difficulties, but God is there to teach us. So that first truth that I want us to understand, that, that it's, it's these concluding truths, these last three things I want to point out. Discouragement and disappointment often result when our high hopes and expectations aren't met. We get high hopes. I've been taught many lessons when my hopes were placed in the wrong things. I've talked about my, my love for sports and how various teams that I cheer for, how they have a winning streak and they go, boy, maybe they're going to do better now. Maybe they're going to win a championship. But oftentimes what I find is when I, when I move towards that, that perspective, I, I'm getting my priorities mixed and I'm realizing my expectations aren't being met. Why? Because my focus in the, is in the wrong place. And oftentimes we are disappointed, we're discouraged when our expectations, our hopes are, are not being met. And Joseph probably had to fight off some emotions when the cupbearer temporarily forgot his request. He temporarily forgot. He didn't forget forever. And let's realize that God still used the cupbearer as the one that allowed Joseph to get out of, out of prison. We're going to see that in chapter 41 next week. But God came through for Joseph, and in, in chapter 41, the cupbearer remembered. And in Psalm 105, in fact, I want to turn there. I want us to see this. I want us to hear this. Psalm 105, listen to verses um, 16 through 24. And it says, And God called for a famine upon the land. And he broke the whole staff of bread. In other words, there was no food anywhere. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who had been sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in, honors, uh, in irons until the time that his word came to pass. In other words, Joseph was there until it was time for him to speak. God's timing. God's timing. 
It says the word of the Lord tested him. God tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the peoples, and set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all of his possessions to imprison his princes at will that he would teach his elders wisdom. Now Israel, Jacob, Joseph's father, also came to Egypt. Thus Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and he caused his people to be very fruitful, and he made him stronger than his adversaries, or than their adversaries. What we see here is that God was at work. God was at work in Joseph, and in spite of the disappointments and the difficulties, Joseph was capable of fighting off those emotions, and God came through. Joseph continued to be faithful in his responsibilities and his roles. So let's realize that disappointments and discouragements, they can result of our expectations if they're misplaced, if they're on the wrong, in the wrong place, if they're not expect expectations from God Almighty, or if we are expecting things from God that God never promised. Let's make sure we understand God's promises. But now secondly, that second of the concluding truths here, God uses times of difficulty, times of discouragement, times of disappointment to train, to teach, and to test us. We just read that in Psalm 105. He tested Joseph and he trained him, he taught him, he prepared him for the ministries that he had. Now, let's us realize that if our focus is properly on the Lord during times of challenge, we look to him, we say, God, teach me, help me, lead me, encourage me, then this leads to hope. Now, God is a God of hope. And we recognize that. Romans 15, verse 13. God's a God of hope. And those of us that believe in him, we can abound in hope when, our, when the Holy Spirit enables us to see God at work. But if our perspective is misguided, if our hopes are misplaced, if our hopes are misguided, if our hopes are, in fact, on things that are not realistic, then that leads to despair. And let's understand that. But then finally, the last point. God is never unfaithful. His promises are always true. But his timing is his timing, not, necessar not necessarily our timing. His grace is sufficient. The Apostle Paul, he's faced times in prison we're not told of Paul's difficulties in prison. He always wrote basically of an encouraging perspective. He basically said in the Philipp to the Philippians, yes, I'm in prison, and yet God is faithful. God is with me. And Paul was recognizing as he went to the, went to the Lord on a number of occasions, he, he prayed and he asked God to remove the thorn from his flesh. Maybe that was prison. I don't know. But God says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And let's understand, God's grace is always sufficient. His grace saves us through our faith in Jesus Christ. His grace sustains us, keeps us focused where it ought to be, keeps us strong in Him. And His grace also, it, it, it basically, it continually guides us. And let's realize that because God is at work in all the details of our life. Romans 8, 28, he causes all things, he orchestrates all things to fit together for what's best for those who love him and for what's best for those who are called to fulfill his purpose. Joseph is one of those. We see that in history and we can see that in our lives too. So as we consider the emotional highs and the emotional lows, let's realize that God's working in the details. And let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your lessons to us. I realize that these various narratives, they seem so far-fetched in ways. They were long ago. We see these things at events that took place. Sometimes we may think, well, do these things actually relate to us? But Father, you show us very clearly in your word that yes, they do. These applications, they are basically things you want us to understand, you want us to trust, and you want us to see how as we take and apply these things into our personal lives, that we will be more successful because you're at work through that. 
Help us to be faithful in all we do. Help us to be filled with integrity, filled with strength, filled with a desire to do your will and to obey you in all counts, Father. Help us in that. I pray for any that watch this video today, Father, if they've not trusted in Jesus Christ, help them realize that it's a simple faith in Jesus. Yes, it's a faith in Jesus, not in anything else. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the punishment for everyone's sin. And if they recognize that their sin can be forgiven because Christ paid that punishment, help them to place that trust, that faith, that confidence in Jesus and what he accomplished and not in anything else. Please, Father, help people understand that truth. Use what's been shown in this lesson today, Father, to give us encouragement and to educate us even more and more to see how your grace is sufficient, how you're working in our lives day by day. Father, thank you. Thank you for the Spirit who indwells us. We love you. We praise you. Help us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for tuning in and watching. Thanks for the opportunity I have to be able to share these things with you. I love to hear from you. I've heard from some, but I haven't heard from all. I see various people. I see uh, a number of views each week on the on the the count for the video, and and you know what? If you'd contact me and let me know, that'd be wonderful. I I, I can be encouraged by that. But I want God, as I said in this, Joseph acknowledged. I want to acknowledge. I want God to get the credit. God to get the glory. He enables us to be what we are for Him. So thanks for watching. Lord bless. Look forward again. To seeing you next week.